Pakistan officials were asked about the supervision and accountability of contractors in war zones. Congressman John Tierney of Massachusetts chairs the Oversight Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs. This is just over two hours. We're being president of the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs, hearing entitled Contracting in Combat Zones, who are our subcontractors will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the chairman and ranking member of the subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements. Without objection so ordered, I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee may be allowed to submit a written statement for the record. Without objection so ordered. Good morning and my apologies for being a bit late. It's, I have to say it's seldom that Mr. Flake <laughs> is here before I am. Uh, so we know that uh, it certainly was unintended, but I appreciate uh, Jeff for being here and all of you for showing up today and giving us your considerable expertise. I uh, sadly report that I understand we're going to have votes at about 1030 so that there will be an interruption on this and we'll try to uh, make it as brief a one as possible uh, and get back here uh, for that. So today we're continuing our oversight on the United States government contracting and our conflicts overseas. Uh, we're going to ask the important questions, who's getting the United States taxpayer money? Uh, and how are they using those funds once they get it? Last week, uh, this subcommittee held a hearing that examined the results of a six-month investigation into the host nation trucking contract in Afghanistan. That investigation uncovered distressing details of how the United States taxpayer money is funding warlordism and corruption in Afghanistan and how the contract is undermining United States counterinsurgency strategy. Equally troubling is the finding that the United States officials charged with overseeing this contract had no visibility into the actual operations of the contractors and subcontractors. In most cases, officials did not know who the subcontractors were, let alone who they employed, how they functioned, and where they spent their money. To give one example, seven of the eight prime contractors in the host nation trucking contract employ, either directly or indirectly, a man by the name of Commander Ruhula, and he provides security for the supply convoys. Commander Ruhula claims to spend one and a half million dollars per month on ammunition and has reportedly attacked convoys that do not use his security services. Still, no United States military officials have ever met with Commander Ruhula, and despite the fact that he receives millions of dollars of taxpayer money, there have been no attempts to enforce the United States laws that govern his U.S.-funded contractual relationship. With $2.16 billion of taxpayer funds at stake, it's unconscionable that the military does not have tighter control over host nation trucking subcontractors. But the host nation trucking contract is not the only problem. This week's Economist reports that 570 NATO contracts worth millions of dollars were issued in southern Afghanistan, but nobody is quite sure to whom. In January, the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, one of our witnesses here today, issued a report about a State Department contract with DynCorp, which noted that, and I quote, over $2.5 billion in U.S. funds were vulnerable to waste and fraud, close quote. In May, the Inspector General for the United States Agency for International Development issued an audit of his private security contractors in Afghanistan, which highlighted significant problems with USAID contracts. It found that USAID does not have, and I quote again, reasonable assurance that private security contractors are reporting all serious security incidents, are suitably qualified, and are authorized to operate in Afghanistan, close quote. Audits from the Department of State, USAID, and others have found problems with subcontractor management in areas as diverse as embassy construction, fuel delivery, and educational outreach programs. The Government Accountability Office, another of our witnesses here today, has reported that the agencies are not even able to accurately report the number of contractor and subcontractor personnel working on United States contracts. And just yesterday, the Wall Street Journal reported that over $3 billion in cash has been flown out of Afghanistan in the last three years. There's $3 billion of cash on a plane flying out of Afghanistan. Officials believe that at least some of that money has been skimmed from United States contracts and aid projects. The conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan have dramatically changed the way the United States wages war. With more contractors than combat troops currently in both countries, the role that these civilians play has become increasingly important. The changing role of contractors have challenged the agencies that employ them. Thus far, the agencies have not risen to meet those challenges. Over the last several years, Congress has tried to impose greater control over contingency contractors and subcontractors, including private security companies. 
The last three Defense Authorization Acts included provisions aimed to strengthen oversight mechanisms and mandate more stringent controls over all of the contractors and subcontractors working on U.S. contracts. These new regulations apparently have not been sufficient. We are here today, however, to not to criticize what has or has not been done so far. We want to work in the spirit of constructive oversight. So today we are asking what can be done to keep these significant problems from reoccurring. We have limited, invited a panel of witnesses with considerable expertise and experience in the area of contingency contracting. It is my hope that today we can discuss what more Congress, the agencies and others can do to increase visibility, oversight and accountability over the contractors and subcontractors who are now crucial to the success of our missions in Iraq and Afghanistan. As we learned from the Hoax Nation trucking investigation, the actions of the subcontractors on that contract may be undermining our entire strategy in the region. With so much at stake, it is time to dig in and find solutions. I look forward to continuing that conversation today. And, and with that, I would like to recognize Mr. Flake for his opening statement. I thank the Chairman. I thank the Chairman for holding this hearing and thank the witnesses for coming. Um, as the Chairman said, given the, the, the report that uh, was issued just a couple of weeks ago in the hearing held last week, uh, this is a very important hearing. There is enough water under the bridge. We have enough time. Uh, with Iraq and Afghanistan, with these contracts in place, uh, to have uh, some kind of history that uh, we can look to and to see what we're doing wrong and what we can do better. So I look forward to the testimony. Well, thank you. Now, with that, we'll introduce the uh, witnesses for today's hearing, and I'll introduce each of you here now, and then we'll start again with Mr. Solis at the end of the introductions, if that's fine. Mr. William Solis is director of the Defense Capabilities and Management Team at the United States Government Accountability Office where he is responsible for a wide range of program audits and evaluations in the area of defense logistics and warfighter support. Throughout his career at GAO, Mr. Solis's audit engagements have included work on military readiness and training, weapon system effectiveness, housing and military doctrine. He has received numerous GAO awards, including the GAO Distinguished Service Award in 2008. Ms. Mary Ugon is the Deputy Inspector General for Auditing in the Department of Defense Office of the Inspector General. Mr. Ugon is a certified public accountant with more than 29 years of accounting experience, the last 26 of which have been with the Inspector General. Ms. Ugon is also chair of the Federal Audit Executive Council from 2007 to 2009 and publicly was recognized by the President of the United States as the 2007 recipient of the prestigious Meritorious Executive Presidential Rank Award. This award is one of the highest in the Federal Government service. She is also a recipient of the Inspector General Distinguished Service Award and the Secretary of Defense Exceptional Civilian Service Award and a member of the Association of Government Accountants and graduate of the Federal Executive Institute. And now that I have said your name three times, have I said it properly? Thank you. I appreciate that. Mr. Stuart Bowen, Jr. is the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction. He previously served as the Inspector General for the Coalition Provisional Authority. Mr. Bowen's mission includes ensuring effective oversight of the $52 billion appropriated for the reconstruction of Iraq. Under the previous administration, Mr. Bowen served as the Deputy Assistant to the President, the Deputy Staff Secretary and the Special Assistant to the President and Associate Counsel. Prior to his White House tenure, Mr. Bowen was a partner at the law firm of Patton Boggs LLP. He also spent four years on active duty as an intelligence officer in the United States Air Force, achieving the rank of Captain. He holds a B.A. from the University of the South and received a J.D. from St. Mary's Law School. We welcome you back, sir. You have been with us before. Mr. Richard Fontaine is a senior fellow at the Center for the New American Security. He previously served as foreign policy advisor to Senator John McCain for more than five years. During his tenure with Senator McCain, Mr. Fontaine worked on numerous pieces of important foreign policy legislation, such as the 9-11 Commission Report Implementation Act. He also served as Associate Director for Near Eastern Affairs at the National Security Council from 2003 to 2004 and as a policy analyst in that same Council's Asian Affairs Directorate. Prior to that, Mr. Fontaine worked in the office of former Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage and in the State Department's South Asia Bureau. Mr. Fontaine holds a B.A. from Tulane University and an M.A. in International Affairs from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. I want to thank all of you for being our witnesses here today and for taking time out of your schedules. Looks like I'll swear you in and we'll go down and vote. Uh, maybe we'll get one or two statements in before we head off if we could. But it is the practice of this committee to swear our witnesses in. So if you please rise and raise your right hands. I ask you if you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. The, the record will please reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. As 
Mr. Bowen knows, and I think the others have, uh, also probably know, that your full statement is going to be entered on the record by consent of the committee members. So we ask that you try to synopsize your remarks down in about five minutes so that we'll have some time for questions and answers after that. So, Mr. Solis, please, if you would. Great. Chairman Tierney, uh, Ranking Member Flagg, members of the subcommittee, appreciate the opportunity to be here to discuss a number of issues related to the DOD's use of contractors to support U.S. forces and contingency operations. The report the subcommittee issued in the hearing uh, held last week focused a number of oversight challenges related to the host nation trucking contract, an important logistics contract providing support to U.S. forces. The oversight issues associated with this contract highlight many of the oversight and longstanding challenges that our reports have addressed in the past. My statement today will focus on some of the challenges the Department continues to face when it uses contract contractors and contingencies like Afghanistan. I will also discuss two steps the Department needs to take to address these challenges in future operations to include the need for DOD to systematically evaluate its reliance on contractors and institutionally plan for their use. As you know, DOD relies greatly on contractors to support its current operations. Currently, there are about 95,000 contractors in Iraq supporting about or 95,000 contracts in Iraq supporting about 90,000 troops and over 112,000 contract personnel in Afghanistan supporting 94,000 troops. In addition, GAO reported that DOD had more than 30,000 contracts in place during fiscal year 2008 and for the first six months of 2009 to support operations in Afghanistan. DOD officials have stated that the Department is likely to continue to rely on contractors to support future contingencies. Based on our ongoing audit work in Iraq and Afghanistan, DOD continues to face a number of challenges to fully integrate operational contract support within the Department, to include finalizing joint guidance for operational contract support as required by Congress, identifying and planning for the use of contractors in support of ongoing operations and in DOD's plans for future contingencies, providing an adequate number of personnel to conduct oversight and management of contractors, training of non-acquisition personnel such as unit commanders and contracting officer representatives on how to work effectively with contractors and contingency operations, and lastly, ensuring that local and host country nationals have been properly screened and badged. Since the mid-90s, we have made numerous recommendations aimed at addressing each of these challenges. While DOD has taken some actions in response to our recommendations, it's been slow to implement others. For example, DOD continues to face challenges in identifying and planning for operations for contract support for ongoing operations. Recently, officials from several battalions who had just returned from Afghanistan told us that when they arrived at their locations, they, that were intended to be their combat outposts, that they lacked housing, heating, laundry facilities, showers, and food services. Additionally, because these units were unaware that they would have the responsibility for obtaining these prior to deploying, they did not plan for and allocate adequate personnel to handle the extensive contract management and oversight duties associated with building and maintaining their combat outpost. As a result, these units had to assign military personnel away from their primary missions in order to handle these contract management duties. Failure to identify and plan for contractor support goes well beyond Iraq and Afghanistan. As we reported earlier this year, the Department has also made limited progress in including the roles of contractors in operational plans for future contingencies. For example, DOD guidance calls for the inclusion of the operational contract support annex in some operation plans. However, of the 89 plans that required such annexes, we found only four plans with these annexes had been approved and the annexes had been drafted for additional 30 plans. As a result, DOD continues to risk, one, not understanding the extent to which the Department will be relying on, com on contractors to support combat operations, and two, being unprepared to provide management and oversight of these contractor personnel because they have not been included in the planning process. Let me just say quickly, DOD has taken some steps to institutionalize contract support, such as establishing a focal point, and they've, in addition, they've uh, issued a variety of contractor guidance. But let me just close and say that in looking towards the future, 
What is needed is a cultural change across DOD that emphasizes the importance of operational contract support throughout all aspects of the department, including planning, training, and personnel requirements. Only when DOD has established its future vision for the use and role of contractors supporting deployed the forces and fuel, fully institutionalizes the concepts of operational contract support can it effectively address its long-term capability to oversee and manage those contractors. It is important that this change occur quickly while current operations keep a significant amount of attention focused on the use and role of contractors uh, and the political will of, exists to affect change, such a change within DOD. A failure to do so will likely result in the department continuing to confront the challenges it faces today in future contingencies. This concludes my statement. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Solis. We appreciate it. Ms. Ugon. Chairman Turney, Ranking Member Flake, and distinguished members of this subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear on behalf of the Inspector General of the Department of Defense to discuss contracting in combat zones. Specifically, I will highlight a few key deficiencies in contingency contracting and discuss related ongoing actions to help prevent waste, fraud, and abuse. Since the early 1990s, we have identified contract management as a major challenge for the Department to overcome, and the Government Accountability Office has continued to identify this area as high risk. The need for expediency in contingency operations, such as in Iraq and Afghanistan, can further increase risks. In May 2010, we issued our report, Contingency Contracting, a Framework for Reform. The intent of the report was to provide a useful tool for commanders and contract managers in their efforts to improve contingency contracting practices. One of the most important areas in contingency contracting is requirements definition because the pace of contingency operations should compel us to get it right in the beginning. In particular, user requirements need to be appropriately translated into contractor performance expectations and measures. In February 2010, we and our colleagues at the Department of State Inspector General Office jointly reported that two task orders valued at $1 billion did not meet defense needs in developing the Afghan National Police because the contract did not allow for rapid changes to the requirements as the security situation in Afghanistan changed. Another important area is adequate administration of the contract. Fundamental steps include having a quality assurance plan and assigning qualified contracting officer representatives. For example, a Special Operations Forces Support Activity contracting officer did not assign a contracting officer representative to 44 service task orders valued at $514 million. Only after a test caused damage to a C-130 aircraft did command officials discover that the contractor improperly installed a part that later cost $219,000 to fix. Sufficient controls of the payment process to ensure that payments are proper is another important area in contingency contracting. For example, Marine Corps officials did not properly over authorize over 9,500 payments, totaling about $310 million. We found that Marine Corps officials made 32 duplicate payments, totaling $2.5 million. One vendor was paid over $200,000 when the Marine Corps paid the same invoice three times. Although the examples I provided today involve the relationship between the department and prime contractors, the need for effective contract management and oversight also exists when the department, through its prime contractors, relies on subcontractors. Subcontracting guidance applies to the phases of the contracting process. For example, during source selection, when required by the contracting officer, offerers must demonstrate the responsibility of their proposed subcontractors. The contracting officer may also require consent to subcontract to adequately protect the government because of the type of subcontract, its complexity or value, or because special surveillance is needed. Additionally, the Federal Acquisition Regulation emphasizes that government quality assurance on subcontracted supplies or services should only be performed when it is in the government's interest. Ultimately, however, the prime contractor is responsible for delivering supplies or services that conform to the contract requirements. 
Therefore, it is the prime contractor's responsibility to ensure that a proposed subcontract is appropriate for the risks involved and is consistent with sound business judgment. There remains continuing concern about whether a prime contractor provides value to the contract when a subcontractor is performing most or all the tasks under the contract. In response to Section 852 of the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2007, the Department of Defense has implemented contract clauses providing the contracting officer with the authority to recover excessive pass-through charges for contracts where the prime contractor or a subcontractor adds no or negligible value in accomplishing the work performed under the contract. The effectiveness of contractor support to expand U.S. operations in Afghanistan and other contingency operations can be improved by applying lessons learned from contingency contracts already executed. Among the steps that can be taken to improve contingency contracting are define what is needed and how it can be measured. Have both program and contracting personnel involved in implementing a well-documented oversight plan and have required documentary evidence such as a receipt of goods and services to support proper payments. In closing, I'd like to add that the top priority of the Office of the Inspector General, Department of Defense, is to provide effective and meaningful oversight in Southwest Asia. We will continue to coordinate and integrate our efforts within the oversight community, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gong. Mr. Bowen. Good morning, Chairman Tierney, Ranking Member Flake, distinguished members. Thank you uh, for inviting me again to appear before the committee to address the challenges of contracting uh, in combat zones, specifically to address the issue, who are our subcontractors? Um, permit me to provide three premises that frame my remarks at the outset. First, the Iraq experience underscores the truism that contracting in a war zone is uniquely challenging and vulnerable to fraud, waste, and abuse. Second, that fraud, waste, and abuse will metastatize unless a well-managed oversight regime is implemented that balances the principle of effective financial stewardship with the goal of mission accomplishment. Third, a weekly resourced contracting course, such as we've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan, will vitiate oversight severely and as you pointed out, Chairman Tierney, potentially undermine mission accomplishment. SIGR has been studying the problems arising from Iraq contracting for the last six years. We've issued 230 reports, chiefly looking at primes, because that's what the FAR tells us about. But we've gotten into some of the subcontracting issues, and in those cases we've seen that the primes frequently don't know who their subcontractors are either. I think part of the reason that Chairman Towns sent his letter to Secretary Gates last November was to get at this issue, to find out what knowledge the Defense Department had about uh, their primes, about the subcontractors, and, and thus this hearing. Uh, two paramount lessons learned arise from, from our reporting that I think still need to be addressed to grapple with this issue. One, as we pointed out four years ago in our contracting lessons learned report, the, the uh, U.S. government should develop and implement a contingency federal acquisition requirement, set of regulations, that is specifically shaped and defined for contingency operations. Two, as part of an overall reform, the recognition that there's a lack of unity of command and thus lack of unity of effort in Iraq and Afghanistan, and a new institution a, should be established, a, a U.S. Office for Contingency Operations that grasps contracting, personnel, IT, all the elements essential to success. And, and that new institution should be given responsibility. Right now we have the Contingency Contracting Corps at GSA, not really functioning. The, the uh, Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization at, at State has the personnel responsibilities, not really engaged in Iraq at all. Uh, very limited in Afghanistan, uh, and, and DOD, meanwhile, is pushing forward with its significant stabilization entities, not effectively integrated. That reform, that challenge, that problem stands before the Congress and the country to fix. Finding out and understanding contract, who our con subcontractors are, who our contractors are in Iraq and Afghanistan should be studied through three lenses, policy, transparency, and accountability. In Iraq, two policies shaped the overall contracting effort. The heavy use of contractors to begin with 
unprecedented uh, in, in the history of contingency operations. In 2008, reaching upwards of 190,000 contractors in country. With a contracting court simply not sufficient, not capable of keeping track of them. Thus, waste. The real issue in Iraq. I think the real issue in Afghanistan, severe waste ensued. Billions of dollars wasted needlessly because of poor quality assurance programs which are intended to ensure there are quality control programs which primes are supposed to implement to cover subcontractors. Didn't get done enough. And as a result, this serious waste occurred. Second, the movement towards using local contractors, understandably from a policy perspective, to build capital, to, to improve employment. But, but in Iraq, we don't know who those contractors are. We don't have a database. It's difficult to track. And thus, there certainly was waste and corruption that ensued. On the transparency front, I think that if the Congress wants to know who our subcontractors are, amending the FAR is a good way to do it. Right now, the only way that, that the contracts that Chairman Towns uh, requested from DOD will reveal who the subcontractors are if the terms of the contract required it. However, if you so chose, you could amend the law to, to require a minimal disclosure of, tr of subcontracting. I think that's a step in the right direction for, towards transparency. And on the accountability front, rebuilding the, the contracting core is an essential element to ensuring not just the oversight of primes, but the oversight of subcontractors. So in summary, I think there are four recommendations that, that we put forward uh, for the committee and for the Congress to consider. Implement the Contingency Federal Acquisition Regulation and develop the U.S. Office for Contingency Operations to manage these, these uh, methods. This is new way forward for protecting our national, national security interests abroad. Second, re-examine the heavy use of of contractors in uh, contingencies and explore whether some inherently governmental functions are in fact being uh, incorrectly outsourced. Uh, third, rebuild the contracting corps. It's ongoing at DOD, but I think it's a government-wide issue and certainly with respect to contingencies, when you have 190,000 uh, contractors in country, you've got to have a contracting corps that's capable. We don't have it today. And finally, amend the FAR as you see fit to give you the transparency, the information you need and want about who our subcontractors are. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and uh, members, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Fontaine. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Flake and members of the subcommittee, thank you very much for granting me the opportunity to testify today, and I'm honored to take part in this hearing. My testimony today is based on a report entitled Contracting and Conflicts, The Path to Reform, released by the Center for New American Security earlier this month. In this report, my CNAS colleague John Nagel and I dis discuss possible solutions to many of the problems that have plagued the expeditionary contracting process. The entire report is available for download on the CNAS website. Our report proceeds from the realization that when our nation goes to war, contractors go with it. The 2001 invasion of Afghanistan, together with the March 2003 invasion of Iraq, saw an increase in the size and scope of contracted support on the battlefield that is unprecedented in U.S. history. Yet the system within which this contracting takes place is not caught up with the new reality. As America's dependence on expeditionary contractors in conflicts or stabilization or reconstruction efforts is likely to continue, the need for reform is pressing. My written testimony details the many recommendations we have made to move down the path to reform. I would like to highlight just a few that we believe are particularly important. First, expand the workforce. As the volume and scale of contracts has exploded in recent years, the number of government workers qualified to oversee them has remained stable or even fallen. It's critical to grow the workforce both in Washington and overseas. Only by expanding the quantity and quality of the government's human infrastructure will the majority of other necessary reforms be possible. Second, increase transparency and scrutiny. The post-invasion reconstruction environments in Iraq and Afghanistan represent the largest ever markets for private contracting firms, which has led to opacity and inconsistent data. DOD, state, and USAID should establish uniform standards across agencies and contract type for consistency and consolidation of data. They should improve the transparency of subcontractors and establish a permanent inspector general and include clauses in contracts that require firms to enforce rules governing behavior that impacts the overall U.S. mission. Third, establish a coordination mechanism within the executive branch. The approach to contingency contracting remains fragmented and ad hoc. 
We propose establishing a formal but relatively simple interagency coordination mechanism in which State, DOD, and USAID would designate one individual and bureau to focus on contingency contracting and then ensure that these individuals meet on a regular basis with OMB and the NSC in order to harmonize policies and standards. Fourth, deal better with the military implications. The unprecedented number of private contractors on the battlefield and the vast scope of their activities pose special dilemmas in command, coordination, and discipline for the U.S. military. The Department of Defense needs to give much more strategic thought to the role that pri private contractors play. They should consult with contractors during the military's mission planning process, include the expected roles of contractors in operational plans and pre-deployment training, and incorporate contracting issues into professional military education courses. Fifth, clarify laws and regulations. The legal framework governing expeditionary contractors in wartime is complicated, it features overlapping jurisdictions, and it's somewhat ambiguous. The Department of Defense, together with the Department of Justice, should clarify how the various laws that potentially apply to contractors in theater interact to create obligations for or jurisdiction over private contractors. We believe that Congress should amend the Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act to unambiguously cover all expeditionary contractors and streamline acquisition regulations that govern U.S. service contracting in hostile environments. Sixth and finally, resolve the inherently governmental conundrum. U.S. law has long aimed to protect the core functions of government by prohibiting anyone other than federal employees from performing such tasks. Yet today there is little consensus about what those functions are. The government should define as inherently governmental those areas in which there is some consensus and move toward a core competencies approach in areas where there is not. Such an approach would focus on the functions the U.S. government should possess and maintain rather than debate internally over which are inherently governmental. To close, I would note that the U.S. government and its contract employees have been thrust together as partners in a shared endeavor, the scale, cost, and duration of which have taken nearly all observers by surprise. The reality is that America's reliance on private contractors is not likely to fade, and it's time for the United States to adapt. As a result, the government, the military, the contracting community, and ultimately the American people will benefit from sweeping reform of the contracting system. Reform that ensures the private sector's role in American engagements aligns firmly with our nation's interests and values. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Fontaine. Thank all of you. And uh, now for the continuation of that bad news I spoke about. I think it's probably more prudent if we just break now and go and vote. There's only a few minutes left on the vote. Uh, there are only two votes, so hopefully we'll be back relatively soon. I would say certainly uh, by about five minutes of 11 or 11 o'clock. So if you want to get yourself a cup of coffee or relax a little bit, uh, my apologies, and we'll be back. So be adjourned until 11. Thank you for your patience on that. We had one more vote that had been anticipated. Uh, and so it took a little bit longer, but we were happy that you're all back with us and ready to start asking some questions, which I'll kick off uh, for five minutes because I want to ask something about the, the basic premise of this whole operation here. We, everybody seems to be testifying on the notion that we've accepted the premise that private contracting and subcontracting is here to stay on contingency operations. Yet every one of you uh, cites numerous problems with oversight, with management and personnel, integration into planning, the command structure, legal issues, liability, responsibility, uh, control over individuals uh, for whom we're going to get the blame, whatever they do, even though they may not be technically in our Department of Defense or our State Department or USAID. So given all of those difficulties uh, and separating out the State and USAID part of it right now, but starting with the Department of Defense, why aren't we giving more consideration to the notion of not having contractors and subcontractors in our military operations uh, where well, we already have established clear lines of responsibility for those in the military, clear lines of management, clear lines of uh, accountability uh, and, and all of that. I mean, it seems to me that, you know, if we just define military operation, uh, operations as inherently governmental because they're military operations in the name of the United States and under our flag overseas, that that would remedy a lot of these problems. Mr. Solis? I'll, I'll take a first stab at it. I think what we've tried to say is that we're, we're not saying that contractors should be used one way or the other. I think we've tried to say 
is that from what we understand from the department uh, in military operations that it's likely that they are going to be part of it. So we're not saying that they are. That being said, going back to what I mentioned in our statement, is that there needs to be a fundamental look at the requirements for contracting if, in fact, you want to do contracting. I don't think we're trying to say that you will use contracting, but if that's what you are going to do in terms of your military operations, you have to plan that up front. You have to look and say, are we going to contract for certain things, not just on the logistical side, that we are using contractors on the intel side and, and, and network operations and a number of other things. We are using them as linguists. Uh, everywhere I go, you know, military members say, I think we've gone too far. But I think there needs to be this fundamental look, see, at the beginning to say whether or not we are going to use them, and if we are going to use them, then we need to put the proper oversight and controls in place. I, I certainly would agree with you there. I I'll tell you something. You know, when I look at all of you talking about being on top of this issue since the 1990s and advising, you know, everybody to, to start looking at these contracts uh, and moving forward or whatever like that, and basically it's a large budget being blown off. I mean, uh, here we are, you know, 20 years later, and you've got a little bit of compliance with some of the recommendations and a whole lot of non-compliance and sometimes inattention uh, to them. So, uh, Ms. Yugan? Yeah, I think the whole issue, and I think my colleagues here have raised it, is the inherently governmental function issue, which is, I believe, OMB has proposed uh, policy definitions of that. Um, the issue is, um, how closely related is it to the inherently governmental function, and sh should these critical capabilities be insourced? I believe there was legislation passed in the last couple of years that requires the military departments to take a look at their ca uh, contracted out capabilities to see whether or not any of them should actually be insourced, which is brought back in-house. And that's one way in which the department can analyze that particular situation. I think there's already legislation out there that there allows. Is, uh, legislation is there, the compliance isn't, and that's, and that's the problem. And, and again, the question goes back to when did war ever become something that wasn't inherent, inherently governmental uh, in all the things that go with it on that. When I see recommendations here of you know, trying to uh, incorporate in and integrate into uh, the command chain contractors so that they're more involved in the planning and the operation and like that, I say, well, if you're going to do that, you might as well have them be on your payroll. Mr. Bowen. Well, Mr. Chairman, you say, when did that happen? I think the time is the late 1980s when exactly. LogCap 1 was created. And, and essentially the support, um, fuel, food, billeting of troops in the field uh, was outsourced. And we've spent now on LogCap in, uh, in Iraq in excess of $35 billion uh, in, in, that, in, 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 that, in those three areas. Uh, the, it's, it's been an incrementalism since the, since the late 1980s. What can be covered is a continuing question in every conflict, and, and, and the answer is always a little bit more. Has anybody ever looked at, you know, what is it that we did in World War II? What is it that we did in the Korean conflict? In terms of that, Mr. Fontaine, it, 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 what a segue, huh? Yeah, yeah exactly. In our uh, report, actually, we have a historical section that looks back, actually, all the way to George Washington. Uh, and contractors, in some way, shape, or form, have played a role in all of our conflicts going back that far. There were, you know, thousands of uh, of contractors working in uh, in Vietnam and Korea. The big change, though, has been what they've done and the dependence that the United States has had upon what they've done. So, in Vietnam, for example, you had a large number of contractors working on construction projects in Vietnam, and that obviously is less controversial uh, in terms of what contractors do. Uh, you know, now we in in the current wars, we've had contractors doing interrogation, private security operations, uh, weight, weapons maintenance. Uh, according to reports, even uh, you know maintaining drone operations, those sort of things, which are much more controversial. So I think that's the big change that's happened over the years: is the scope of activities that contractors have begun to carry out, and because we have you know upwards of 200,000 contractors now in Iraq and Afghanistan, if you pulled those out of the operation or tried to federalize them all, it'd be very difficult to do so. Uh, and I wonder how easy it would be to keep voting to be over there involved in these conflicts if it was 200,000. Uh, people, the United States citizens in combat, as opposed to you know ninety thousand in one place with uh, one hundred and ten thousand contractors, sort of off the books. 
Well, this is another the political consideration, right? I mean, I think this is another aspect of it: is the the political cost uh, goes down to the, the degree that contracting support goes up, because you know we we always mourn the losses of American service people who are killed. They're on the faces of the fallen tributes and everything else, but contractors die and are hurt, um, and they barely register. Uh, so there's a reduction in the political cost of these operations. But I think at the same time, unless uh, the United States has a very significant reduction in its international national commitments, which personally I think is relatively unlikely, at least in the near to, mid to midterm, then we will probably continue to rely with our current force structure on contractors to do the work that our military is not big enough to carry out on its own. Thank you. Mr. Flake. Let me just follow on with that theme if I could, and Mr. Boeing, Mr. Fontaine first. Um, we, the report that was issued uh, with regard to uh, the Warlord Inc., um, this is one, and it was mentioned before by Mr. Solis that uh, you take into account both efficiency and whether or not it, it uh, aids our policy, our overall policy goals. This is one where when you have local contractors with the trucking contract, it's, it's I think undoubtedly the most efficient way to move, move goods between military bases in Afghanistan. But when we find out that a significant portion of the money that's uh, that uh, is used to pay those contracts is going for protection money to some very unsavory characters, some of whom are very tight with the Taliban or are or, or contracting with the Taliban for this protection. That certainly runs counter to our policy, uh, our counterinsurgency policy, which calls for one source of authority, that being the Afghan government, and no parallel uh, authority structures there that we're, in this case, not only tolerating, we're building up uh, these militias uh, and warlords and whatnot. What, how do we reconcile that? It, it kind of goes back to what the chairman was talking about and where, you know, the, the political cost, certainly if we, if we did what the Soviets did, use their force structure to guard the supply lines, uh, according to this report, it was 75 percent of their force structure. That would require, you know, a doubling of our number of troops. And it wouldn't be very efficient, and we'd have certainly more casualties, uh, but it may be the only way to run a, an effective counterinsurgency policy as we've defined it. Uh, how, how do we reconcile that, or can we reconcile that? Um, Mr. Bowen, you want to give it a shot? Well, the, the issue, uh, the policy issue, I guess, is using financial resources to, per to pacify a region, and, 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 and it was certainly expedient in, in your, uh, an expedient process, uh, ad hoc, uh, it, with respect to uh, the, the, the keeping the trucking routes safe. In, in Iraq, much more complicated, more, much more thought through process, the Anbar Awakening, the, the Sons of Iraq program, spent in excess of $450 million of Commander's Emergency Response Program money to pacify Anbar province uh, and, and regional areas. Um, similar policy issues, different approaches to how well thought out, how well structured those, the execution of the two programs was. Uh, in Afghanistan, the policy execution was essentially expedient and almost outsourced, as you point out. In Iraq, it was, it was carefully thought through, as was the transition of the main, maintenance of that pacification program, now born financially by the Iraqi government. Mr. Fontaine, do you have any thoughts on that? From that, you know, the 35,000 foot level, how does this look in terms of the use of contractors in this trucking contract? Well, obviously, uh, in any war, uh, funneling money to your enemy uh, is not a good idea. So I think you should start from that premise. Um, I do think that at some point there may need to be a fundamental choice made um, whether to uh, proceed whether the effects are mitigated uh, through more oversight and that kind of thing, uh, to proceed in a fashion where we are willing to trade money in order to have a pacified area through which our supply lines can travel, knowing that some of that money will go to our enemy, or whether we're willing to tolerate the potential of more casualties and more disruption of our supply lines. I think that that's probably a fundamental choice. Uh, but when it comes to counterinsurgency, I think that uh, not only do they have all the problems that you just 
just described when it comes to aiding our enemies, reducing government legitimacy, uh, giving them more opportunity to attack rather than to not attack. But I also think there's a strategic communications issue to this. We're supposed to be on the side of the good guys. Uh, and so as word gets out uh, that uh, we are sort of willingly or knowingly uh, providing money that ends up in the hands of the Taliban, I wonder if uh, that pr promotes a sense that the United States is not in this sort of for the long term in order to actually see the government succeed rather than trying to go with short-term expediency. Thank you. Ms. Yugon, I have just a moment left. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there are provisions if there's no value added uh, from the, having the prime contract or, or the subcontractors that uh, we have the authority to pull back some of the funds uh, used for that. How often is that utilized? Um, we haven't done work in the area on the pass-through. That was legislation that was enacted, I think, in FY 2007. But one of the things that it, w it focuses on is the subcontractor level. We do plan to do some work based on the contingency contracting framework for reform. We've identified where primes have had problems. Well, we plan to take a look at the primes that are primarily IDIQ contracts and we're going to go down to the sub-level to see if there is issues, are issues related to pass-through, as well as other issues related to uh, subcontractor responsibility let as well. Just, let me just ask it another way quickly. Um, you're not aware of any instance where we've actually pulled back funds? No. We have, I, I'm not aware of any instance about recovering excess costs. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Ms. Chu, you recognize five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Well, last week we found out that in the course of investigating the host nation trucking contract that uh, military largest, uh, logisticians were relying on reports from prime contractors to gain visibility into the subcontractors that were actually driving the trucks and providing security for the convoys. And there was strong evidence that uh, these subcontractors were, were paying off the Taliban. Um, this is a very distressing situation. and. Uh, what I'd like to ask the panel is, is, in general, what areas of oversight are appropriate for DOD to leave up to the prime contractor, and what areas should DOD take a more direct role in overseeing, and in doing so, how could we prevent this uh, corruption from occurring? You know, I think, um, and uh, one of the things in, pre in preparing for this hearing, it became a, quite apparent that the federal acquisition regulation has not kept up with subcontract management. We just took one contract out of here, an IDIQ contract, with I believe it was five prime contractors, and there are 200 subcontractors under that prime. If you take a look at the federal acquisition regulation, there are provisions, but as far as subcontract management, I don't think it's kept up with the level of sub subcontractor performance that's required under these primes. So I think there needs to be a look at the federal acquisition regulation with respect to subcontract management. Are there not guidelines for this? There are, and um, there is, and I talked about a little bit in my, um, in my opening statement. There's the consent to subcontract, which is if the contracting officer requires uh, a, a prime uh, to provide uh, information on their subs in order for the contracting officer to consent to subcontract, then there is some insight into subcontractor responsibility. But if the contracting officer does not require that, then you're not going to have the insight. And uh, the provisions in the current FAR uh, allows a lot of leeway to the contracting officer. And, and what would change it so that you could have this more stringent oversight of the subcontractor? Excuse me, I, I didn't quite hear the question. What, what could, where would it, uh, what would it take to change it so that you could have this Well, one change? of the things is, I think the provisions, let me just take the situation with the warlord situation. Um, the contracting officer can, under the current provisions of the FAR, designate um, subcontracts in that situation is something that requires special surveillance or special uh, oversight. It does allow in the, um, in the FAR to do that. For example, you could say to the prime, I need to 
be able to consent to you con subcontracting with these primes. I need to get insight into your subcontractors. I can also establish perhaps a special surveillance program for those particular subcontractors. So there are some provisions, but it's up to the contracting officer uh, to determine whether or not those provisions are invoked. And it, there are some other additional requirements that have to do with a contractor purchasing system, and it gets a little bit more detailed as to when you have to get um, a consent to subcontract from the contracting officer. Uh, Ms. I want to ask another question about the culture at the Department of Defense. And uh, Mr. Solis, you talked about um, the fact that the contracting reform at DOD is hampered by the department's inability to institutionalize operational contract support by accepting contractors as an integral part of the total force. But I also note that um, you have you had had several recommendations, but the DOD has been slow to implement um, ha has been slow to implement uh, many of the recommendations. What could change this culture? I, I think one of the things, again, and I think the joint staff, and I think this was alluded to at the hearing last week, there was a joint staff study to look at the reliance on contractors in Iraq. And I think that, again, begins the process of looking how reliant that, that DOD is, not only for Iraq, but for future operations in terms of the reliance. I think also, as I mentioned in the testimony here, when you look for future operations, there are requirements to look for there are requirements in, uh, to produce what was called an ANXW, which looks at uh, contractor requirements for new operations or future operations. That has got to be done. That has got to be done very rigorously and, and on time. And I think unless, we, unless the department does, does that kind of thing, we're going to be in the same situation talking about another contract the next time. I, I think um, the only other thing I would offer is that I know in the, in the current version of the defense authorization bill that the Senate just put passed, that they made some changes to the uh, requirements for looking at contractor requirements uh, in, in the defense bill. And that's going to be part of the QDR, uh, at least as, env as envisioned now. So it's going to bring that strategic look up, up to it at, at that point. I still think there are base some basic problems in terms of, again, as I mentioned, lessons learned, uh, you know, background screenings. Uh, I think those things are on, we're on record with some of the recommendations to make changes to that. For whatever reason, the department for, has, has not acted upon all, all those in a timely manner. We're still trying to pursue some of those. But again, I think the fundamental piece is that you've got to look at your reliance on contractors before you start making other adjustments. Thank you. Yield back. Mr. Duncan, you recognize five minutes. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and th thank you for having and holding another hearing and trying to call it all the waste, fraud, and abuse, the one scandal after another that's uh, gone on through these <clears throat> many years that uh, we've been in Iraq and Afghanistan. Throughout uh, all this time, uh, we've had uh, more contractors and subcontractors than we've had um, uh, soldiers um, in these areas. I heard Mr. Fontaine say a moment ago that uh, the use of contractors by the um, military has gone on since uh, the founding of the country, but uh, I can tell you there's uh, uh, never been the um, uh, ridiculous markups, the excessive, almost obscene profiteering, the uh, there's never been the rip-offs of, uh, of the taxpayers that have gone on to the extent that they have gone on in Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, these wars have always been more about, um, far more about money than they have been about any real threat to this uh, nation. It's, uh, it, it's really um, uh, shameful, and it's, and it's very, very sad um, what has gone on, and that's... Uh, um, there, there's really no real way to correct it. When, when you have a private uh, uh, companies dealing with each other, things are done at, a, at a, four, a fourth or a third or half of the cost that you have when you have the federal government involved uh, dealing with contractors and the Department of Defense 
because of the uh, lobbying influence of retired admirals and generals has uh, has been the worst uh, uh, um, and the most expensive of any of the federal contractor uh, contracting that's gone on by our government. Uh, but that's that's really all I have to say. I thank you very much for giving me this time. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Mr. Lynch, you're recognized five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, Mr. Bowen, good to see you again. Mr. Bowen, uh, you and I have had a pretty long history over the Iraq reconstruction model. I've been to Iraq 12 times working with you uh, to try to uh, tighten up the situation there. We started at a very low basis and uh, uh, I think there were a lot of lessons learned. What troubles me is that now when I more often visit Afghanistan, I don't see that the lessons learned in Iraq are, are are being used in Afghanistan. And uh, it distresses me greatly. I've been involved with the chairman on this uh, host nation trucking issue, went down and tried to meet with a couple of the warlords down there on the Afghan-Pakistani border. Uh, they ended up shutting down the, uh, the pass there at Spin Bullduck and shut off the trucking because uh, they didn't want me down in that area asking questions. and. Uh, I just have come to question whether or not uh, even the, the modest and, and painful gains that were achieved in, in Iraq are possible in Afghanistan. And I'm wondering, uh, Mr. Bowen, because you know, you're the Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, you're, you're the one who uh, was the point person for us. Can you point, now I know you've helped the, the Inspector General, the SIGAR, right, Special Inspector General for Afghan reconstruction. <clears throat> I know you've you've helped them file some reports. The reports That's are right. at least the ones that I've seen and asked for. That they are well, very poor. I would say in my, my estimation, going into Afghanistan and asking for a progress report and where we are, uh, even if it's not a just a status report, even if there's no progress to report, just tell us where we are. Uh, that information has been uh, very poor, not very informative. Uh, when I compare it to the information I get from you and your office in Iraq, and I, I know you've been helping them generate some reports, but uh, look, I have low confidence in the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction. Uh, it may be because of the, the environment there. It may not be his office. It may be it's just a different environment, and I'm, my expectations are too high. But uh, I was wondering if you could, you could share uh, you know, just some of the lessons learned in Iraq and maybe some things going on in Afghanistan you, you think could be done better? Well, first, Mr. Lynch, I think almost exactly two years ago we had a colloquy in this room about subcontractors, and that was regarding the DynCorp contract. And you identified in our then recently released audit, our first one on DynCorp, that, that a, a subcontractor who 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 apparently didn't do much work but uh, pocketed eight million Kojum Corp and then Corporate Bank. You remember for the police training camp that never got completed. Uh, I point that out simply to say that this is a continuing and enduring problem. And that is ensuring that taxpayer interests are protected while mission uh, goals are achieved. Uh, one, one doesn't trump the other. Uh, reform still needed, and 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 the reason for the, that shortfall then, and the shortfalls that you saw in Afghanistan, the shortfalls that are experienced today in both countries, is is the lack of transparency, not no no required reporting as we've heard today, uh, regarding subcontractors, the lack of effective accountability, insufficient oversight presence in country, you, you know you went outside the wire, we've been outside the wire a lot in Iraq. Yeah, I know we've been together, you and I, and, and sometimes when, we, when our inspectors have visited sites uh, frequently, we're the first Americans that they've seen in a long time. And so the quality assurance programs being done outside the wire are not sufficient to protect those taxpayers' interests, notwithstanding the importance of the, of the mission goals. Uh, what lessons should be applied? 
two that that are in my statement. One, the, the, the contingency federal acquisition regulation that we've talked about before, recommended four years ago in our lessons learned report. I think these settings, as you point out, are unique, uniquely difficult and uniquely susceptible to fraud, waste, and abuse, and, and therefore special focused contracting regulation should be developed for all agencies to use in theater. What, what I think most don't realize is there are multiple versions of the FAR at work in both Iraq and Afghanistan because each agency can amend and apply the FAR as it sees fit to contracting uh, overseas. That creates problems for contractors, it creates problems for contract management uh, and causes waste, which is ultimately the, uh, where the taxpayers' interests are shortchanged. Um, I think also that, the, that we've talked about the need for unity of effort in, in, in uh, contingency operations. And we don't have that in Afghanistan. We haven't seen it sufficiently in Iraq. Uh, it shouldn't be dependent on personality. It ought to be driven by structure. And that structure ought to be something like the U.S. Office for Contingency Operations that would bring contracting, bring IT, bring personnel, bring planning, bring oversight, bring execution under one roof. Right now, all those elements are diffused across the agencies in a disordered fashion, and the results, unfortunately, are occasionally revealed in uh, oversight reporting. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. Let me continue on the line, Mr. Solis. Your testimony recalled the December 2009 trip to Afghanistan that you took, and you were told by members of the Defense Contract Management Agency that they required at least 47 more subject matter experts for contract oversight. And since government personnel were unavailable, they planned to staff those positions with contractors. What the hell are we doing? So, I mean, obviously I'm going to ask you what I, th I think I know what your answer is going to be. I mean, is this why strategy in your part? You're going to hire out contractors to oversee contractors? It, it's being done. I'm not saying that it's the way it should be done. I think, again, it's through the lack of, of planning for the use of contractors. I think, again, you've got to look at what are your requirements are going to be. And, and if we're going to be doing more contracting and if we're going to require people who have to have technical backgrounds, particularly in the construction trades, the engineering trades, do, is this where we want to be? And I think the, ultimately this is what they may have had to do because they had no other choice. I'll be of that choice since the late 80s, as, uh, as Mr. Bowen says. They've, they've had this issue since the late 80s. You folks have pointed it out to them over and over again. It seems to me that just total non-responsiveness, certainly very insufficient non responsiveness on that. Uh, following in that line that you talked about the risk-based approach for contract officer representatives. They're going to assign uh, contract officer representatives to oversee only those contracted services related to health and safety such as food service and power generation, leaving other services with no contract officer representative and only quarterly oversight. How smart is that? Well, we haven't looked at it in detail, but my understanding is that they were categorizing, you know, high and medium risk and they were going to, as you mentioned, uh, not really, it's not that they weren't going to have oversight, it's that they were going to have less oversight. They were not going to review those contracts as, as, uh, as often. I think it was maybe once a quarter. Or, or a shorter, longer periods of time, it does create risk. Okay. It, it's in, and certainly just by looking at some of these contracts and things, I think that that you've got to continue to look at: is this going to increase my risk? Is it going to? I think there's got to be a continual review. You just cannot say I'm not going to do this ever again and look at, because I think you're just going to set yourself up for problems. Mr. Gunn. They talked about a deployable cadre of experts. There was testimony to that regard. Do you have any information on how the Department of Defense is progressing with regard to identifying a so-called deployable cadre of contracting experts? Um, as far as the deployable contracting experts, I don't have a macro view, a much more selected view, depending on the contract. For example, the INL contract, the International Narcotics Law Enforcement contract we looked at, that was a billion dollars on equipping and training Afghan um, national police, uh, we, were, uh, we were told by um, the command that they stood up a contracting officer representative oversight structure just for that one contract. But we do have concerns about contingency contracting in Afghanistan, particularly using our framework for reform. The, the area that is, that is problematic 
is getting the requirements right and translated into the contract correctly and then monitoring and paying. We have concerns about those same issues again in Afghanistan. Um, and that's one of the things that uh, we want to watch as the money flows in to equip and train the Afghan National Police and the security forces. Thank you. I, mean, I, mean, I think you made that point quite well. And, and unfortunately, this cuts right across a number of government agencies. And it cuts across a number of functions. And we look at it in the procurement aspect as well. Uh, too little oversight, too little people that are, that are professionalized in managing the contracts and, and all that pertains to that. So that we had people in one case, so at least you know, we contracted out to people to oversee the contractor, only they did it to the same company. You yeah. know, so that's how absurd it gets. Yeah, I think the key is you're going to get it wrong at the end if you don't get it right at the beginning. Right. If you don't translate those requirements correctly and you don't plan the acquisitions and you don't have a strategy for how you're going to spend the money, then you're going to have a problem. Uh, definitely. Well, I'm beginning to think that we can't rely on the Department of Defense and maybe the State Department of USAID to do this any longer. It's been since the late 80s. We've maybe got to put a SWAT team together to just get these things in place and just uh, shove it on them. But we'll, we'll see about that. I'll yield to Mr. Flake for, for his questions before I get back. Mr. Solis, um, obviously DOD, the contracting that DOD does dwarfs everything any other agency of the U.S. government does. Uh, but uh, what you know, best practices can we look at from some of the other agencies that could be done here? Uh, what are some of the other agencies doing, or, or is it applicable at all, uh, given the scale that we're dealing with here at DOD? Congressman, we, I, I have not, my work has been focused on the DOD side, right. so I can't really answer your question in terms of best practices. Obviously, I think the department knows the things that it has to do. Again, it just hasn't always translated into doing those best practices. And again, things like doing lessons learned, uh, as, as Stuart mentioned. I think translating that over from, uh, from Iraq to Afghanistan, whether it's reconstruction or military operations mm -hmm. on the use of contractors. So I think the department is aware of the kinds of things that it needs to do in, in terms of those best practices. And so I, I think it's a matter of implementation at this point. And I don't, I, you know, and, and they do a lot of contracting. I can't really speak for state or aid in terms of what I would deem as best practices for, for, for DOD. But I think DOD is aware of the things that it needs to do. I think it's a matter of implementation at this point. That matter of implementation, is it uh, incumbent on us then to I mean, we can rewrite the regs, uh, but nothing has seemed to work to prompt them other than simply withholding funds and then you get into policy issues that are bigger than all of this. Uh, 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 there is obviously a lot of guidance out there already. As I mentioned, I think there is another attempt uh, in the current version of the NDA to try to raise this at a more strategic level in terms of planning for the overall use of contractors and operations and military missions. And I think that's one of the first things that's got to be done. I think, I think holding the folks accountable and feet to the fire in terms of implementing these regulations is probably the next step. But I think there is an awful lot of guidance. I, I think the other thing I would mention is that, you know, we talk about this in a contracting sense. I think the other uh, entity within DOD that's got to step up to the plate is the personnel and readiness side because I think it is a force structure issue. Again, how we look at Iraq or Afghanistan, we have nearly a couple hundred thousand personnel, both contractors and military members, doing the mission. Uh, and is that where we want to be? Is that how we want to do these things? Are the kinds of things that contractors doing today are the things that we want to do for future operations? So that's where I think also it's not just the contracting side. I agree with everything that my colleagues have said about things like requirements and planning, but I also think it's got to be a force structure issue and it's got to look and see at where we want to be with, with, with uh, personnel, both contractors and military members. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bowen, uh, we talked at one point in time about the idea of having a Inspector General for Contingency Operations. Uh, what are your current thoughts on that and, and how would that improve our ability to at least oversee any progress or lack of progress from these various agencies in this area? Well, ha having a standing Special Inspector, a standing Inspector General for Contingency Operations would simply ensure that the oversight was well prepared in advance of any operation beginning. Uh, in, in both Iraq and Afghanistan, 
adequate oversight was not created till well after those operations were underway. And in Afghanistan's case, seven years after it was underway. I mean, the, the dam had broken. Uh, the disaster was unfolding. It's difficult to, uh, to, to make a, a significant difference as I think we were able to make in Iraq through lessons learned reporting that, that helped course, the course corrections get implemented. Uh, thus, I think it makes perfect sense and, 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 uh, and fits within the, uh, the gist of this hearing of the need for greater accountability together with more transparency. Mr. Fontaine, can you compare for us the, um, the competencies involved when the military oversees its own personnel versus how well they do in, in overseeing the conduct of contractors? Well, this is an ongoing problem uh, related to the laws, regulations, and internal command structures that the military has versus what the contractors have. The contractors, at the end of the day, are responsible to the terms of their contract. Uh, Non-fulfillment of the contract has certain penalties, but not the same penalties that, for example, military uh, military personnel have if they don't uh, obey an order, where you know they can be court-martialed. Uh, so the discipline and uh, the command and control procedures on the military side are much clearer and crisper on the on the military side rather than on the contracting side. On the contracting side, the, there has been increasingly an attempt to write into the contracts themselves some of these. So, for example, uh, contractors before were not subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. They are now subject to some provisions of the UCMJ. Contractors, in some cases before, were not subject to, uh, to fragmentary orders and, and other orders given by commanders in the field. Now, uh, many contractors are subject to those. So there's been a move in the right direction, but I think you fundamentally will have um, a disjunction between uh, the way military uh, personnel operate and contractors doing the same function simply because of who they're responsible to at the end of the day. Thank you. You know, I didn't see Mr. Welsh was back, and I don't want to usurp his time. Mr. Welsh, I want to recognize you for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the witnesses for the good work they're doing. Uh, one of the, the, the contradictions, of course, is that the more we spend on contracting, uh, the, the more we undercut the chain of command uh, in the military. Uh, and I want to just ask your opinions on, on things, because you're not the ones who make the decisions. Uh, Mr. Solis, I understand it's been recently reported that there's a hundred million dollar million dollar contract uh, to for Blackwater, now known as XE, uh, to provide security to CIA bases. And um, as you know, Blackwater's got an incredible history. Uh, the Nisor Square incident, they fatally shot 17 uh, Iraqis. Uh, and it all it looks very much like it was a, a, a hair trigger kind of response. Uh, uh, in December 07, Blackwater officials allegedly authorized secret payments of a million dollars to Iraqi officials to buy their support for allowing the company to continue in business. Uh, the company's under continuing investigation with the Foreign Corrupt uh, Practices Act. Uh, in 09, Blackwater lost its State Department contract to, to uh, provide diplomatic security for U.S. officials in Iraq because of the Nisor uh, Square incident. and. Uh, in April 20, uh, 2010, federal uh, pro prosecutors charged five um, uh, former senior Blackwater officials with weapons violations and making uh, false statements. I mean, why in the world would we enter into any new contract with uh, a company like that? Can you explain that to me other than the urgent I'm not assessment? sure I can answer the question, uh, Congressman, uh, in detail, but I think it's obvious that when the folks who are making the decision on that contract, they obviously have to look at past performance, uh, how those folks have worked in, in the past. Obviously, the things that you've raised would, would, would raise concern, I would imagine, but not being in the decision chain, I don't know exactly how that decision would have, would have been made by, by uh, the folks who are Ms. making it. Mr. Gone, how about you? I mean, well, there are a couple of things. Um, definitely, as Bill had said, past performance. And we did an audit a couple, a few years ago. And frankly, the population of past performance information, we're not doing a very good job of populating that. That actually would be quite helpful um, in um, having primes register that kind of information. They also have a section in the past performance information blocks for also providing information on subcontractors. Um, 
At the same time, there also should be um, a look at whether or not any of these subs are on the excluded parties list or have been suspended or debarred. There are numerous checks that the contracting officer yeah. can use. Well, let, me, let me just develop on this because obviously the, you, you can have a list where the history of the subcontracts is made available to the people that are going to be signing a contract. But obviously in the case of Blackwater, it's well known what their record is. So that wasn't a mystery to the CIA. And one of the dilemmas that I think we have, and, and maybe Mr. Bowen, I'll ask you to comment on this, is that the, the urgent requirements of providing security in this case to our CIA officers and forward operating bases, uh, which obviously has to be a compelling concern for Mr. Panetta, outweigh considerations about criminal allegations, uh, reckless use of violence by a company because they can, quote, more or less get the job done. So that internal contradiction uh, means that uh, we waive decency in some respects and go back to Blackwater despite their sorry record. Do you have any comment on that? I think it's almost a rhetorical question. We can't waive a core principles uh, of stewardship of the right. taxpayer dollars. Mission accomplishment uh, has to be balanced with with the core principles of oversight and execution in country. And and mission accomplishment does not trump those principles. Uh, uh, I think, though, regarding the subcontracting issue, we've talked about it today. So much of it's discretionary. You know, what, right. what, what, what kind of information can you as an oversight body get access to to find out what's going on below that surface uh, so that you can, you and, and frankly, departments can make better judgments. And, and that calls for some, I think, amendment of the federal acquisition regulation that will give you uh, data, information about subcontractors so that, so that from here, from this dais, you can, you can make judgments about how the primes are doing. All right. Well, I commend you for the good work you've been doing over the years. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sir. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lynch, do you care for any further questions? I sure. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fontaine, uh, right now, uh, it, it seems that uh, since, since the beginning of the war in Iraq and, and up to the present, there's been a trend uh, to, to subcontract out, to contract out uh, core government services. The argument initially made by the Bush administration is that this was going to allow us to save some money here. There was some efficiencies gained here. But after, you know, after all of our experience, I, I just don't see that. Is there, is there cause to revisit that assumption that, that contracting out, uh, while, while, it, while it does allow us to tap into some expertise that's not available or wasn't available at the time, uh, is there cause here for us to review that decision to, to contract out government services rather than have, rather than to build internally our government capacity to actually do this with government employees? Yeah, I think I would divide that into two separate points. The first is on the cost uh, and providing comprehensive cost uh, comparisons between contractors and government personnel carrying out the same function. Um, and I think our uh, GAO colleague may uh, be able to say more on this, but it's proved to be exceedingly difficult um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the last GAO reports required uh, data from the Department of Defense in order to make this comparison. Department of Defense was unable to provide the data. Um, but. Uh, there seems to be a difference in cost as you sort of move up the skills chain. So if you're going to hire locals or third party nationals to do things like construction or laundry or mail service, then you're much more likely to save money uh, than to do things sort of at the top of the skills, um, private security, more engineering functions, where if you hire Americans, you may be paying on a per day basis more than uh, you would pay to a, an American um, official to do the same things. The, the benefits seem to be less on the cost side often and more on the the quick deployability uh, of such contractors into a war zone. Um, on the inherently governmental side, um, there is certainly reason to try to revisit this whole issue. Our recommendation has been to try to move away um, from trying to divide every single activity into inherently governmental and then against the law to ever contract out or not inherently governmental, which doesn't mean that it's a good idea to contract out. Right. It just means it's not against the law. Uh, and instead move to 
something that you were sort of uh, suggesting, which is try to determine the universe of activities which it is a good idea for the United States government to have an in-house capacity to carry out rather than to contract out and move toward that. And then only an extremist, if we need to contract that out, then we might be able to have the flexibility to do that as a surge capacity. But that shouldn't be the run of the mill way we do our operations. In, in, in our recent experience, we have found that uh, our uh, federal pension rules, uh, it, you know, we have some very, very highly skilled, experienced personnel who we could really use in Afghanistan and, and Iraq. The problem is that if we brought them back in as, as uh, government employees, and this goes for Treasury, DOD, the, the, the whole nine yards, uh, they would have to, well, they, they would basically violate their pension rules and they would be penalized for, for coming back. Uh, recently in, in the subcommittee that I chair uh, on federal employees, we've actually entertained creating some flexibility there to, to allow uh, folks to come back for a year, uh, to, to come back into government employment without violating uh, uh, their, their pension rules and without being penalized to come back onto the payroll and to provide that service for a year or 18 months and then, then go back into retirement. Uh, is that the type of flexibility that, that might help us in some of those, those upper tranche uh, responsibilities that, that you referred to? Yeah, the double dipping problem that you refer to is a real issue. And I think that that definitely makes sense on the upper tranche, but I would also say that it makes sense on the contract officer, contract management level. Uh, a number of people have pointed out correctly that we do not have enough contract officers in the U.S. government to oversee these contracts. Right. That has led to fraud, waste and abuse problems, all sorts of other problems. You cannot mint a qualified government uh, contract officer in five days, maybe right. not even in a year. Uh, and you also often can't just pluck one who's never done government contracting from the private sector. What you may be able to do is get folks who were contract officers in the government before, but who have left the government and have pensions, don't have an incentive to come back in because they'd have to give that up, uh, you know, be able to come back in for a year or two years or something like that to serve their country and put their expertise to use. So I think that that makes perfect sense. Okay. My time has expired. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. You have a question like that. So, Mr. Solis, you, you talked in your report about uh, contracting reform at the Department of Defense being hampered by the Department's inability to institutionalize operational contract support by accepting contractors as an integral part of the total force, uh, which is part of my reaction to that was, if you're going to do that, you might as well make them part of the total force. But assuming that that, what I think is common sense, doesn't prevail, uh, what are the major obstacles that you think are preventing the Department of Defense from actually doing that, from accepting contractors as an integral part of their, uh, their force? Again, I think that was reiterated going back to what the Department said in its 2006 QDR. And I think it's always been out there just to reframe in terms of what the reliance on contractors would be. I mean, they've, they've said that their total force includes, you know, military members, uh, the DA civilians and contractors. And I think in terms of trying to get to that point about institutionalization, and, and, and again, I keep hammering this thing about planning, 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 planning. And I think it's something that they, while they do a lot of on the military side, for the military uh, force structure piece, it's, it's left out in gaps. Uh, for the contractor side. I think the Army, for example, does what they call a total Army analysis. And I was talking before I came to this hearing about the fact that there's a piece in there about doing something for contractors. To my knowledge, that has not ever been done. And I think what has to happen is that you've got to look at what, what you're going to need for your military force structure. And if I have gaps, then you've got to make a policy decision. Do I want to fill that with military members? Do I want to fill that with civilians, or do I want to fill that with contractors? Mm -hmm. And if I want to fill it with any of those, but particularly contractors, then what are the risks involved with those? What are the requirements? And then what am I going to need to absorb that contractor force into that force structure? And I think, again, it's got to be something that the military makes as a top priority. I know the Secretary has talked about this, and uh, Admiral Mullen has talked about this, but I think the time is now 
that it's got to be done at the highest levels. We've heard the talk as well. This is not the first hearing that we've had to make some of these points or whatever. Do you know of any effort that's actually gone from talk to action? Well, again, I, it's, it's been ad hoc. I think it's, there have been efforts, as I mentioned, the Joint Staff Study, which was to look at reliance on contractors in Iraq. I think there, there's efforts to put planners out at uh, the different combatant commands to help them prepare and do the Annex Ws. But again, it's, not been, it's been slow. And so I think there needs to be a more forceful effort at the highest levels to implement and do the things that are already on the books. There's a lot of guidance. Uh, there's workforce uh, planning uh, guidance out there that includes not only just contractors, but again, military, the whole force structure of what you need to conduct your military operations. I mean, the slowness of, of activity, it, it borders on insubordination almost, the, the, the failure to respond and actually do some of these things. And, uh, it's frustrating from the policy, and I think the legislation is pretty much in place. I think in a lot of cases the regulation is pretty much in place. It's just the actual execution that we keep waiting on and waiting on and waiting on. So uh, we've got to think of some strategy from our end and from the White House's end, frankly, to get this thing in gear. If I just want to wrap things up. If nobody else has any other questions, I'll give people an opportunity. But we didn't really talk a lot about background screening, badging, and tracking of uh, local personnel. Uh, which did come up during our last hearing on the trucking situation. It was a, an important factor. In fact, the witnesses came up afterwards to reiterate uh, how important it was for them to be able to identify the, the subcontractors out there. And in Iraq, uh, Mr. Bowen, we seem to do it one way, sort of theater-wide. In Afghanistan, it appears that they're doing it in an ad hoc, case-by-case -case institution or installation-type uh, basis of you know, trying to make sure that there's some aspect on that. So if there's, in fact, a Department of Defense-wide screening policy that's absent, on that. Do we know uh, whether or not your agency, Mr. Solis, or uh, Ms. Agone, have, have you done any work in this area or made any recommendations? Actually, we do have some ongoing work right now on the issue of um, contractors occupying sensitive positions that don't have proof of clearances. Um, there is existing regulation in the department that needs to be complied with, and the issue is uh, is is a compliance issue. Um, that report that we're uh, working on right now, we're expecting it to go final in the next uh, month or two. But we have issues in, in that regard as well. And the Department of Defense is are they moving forward on this as well? Uh, well, de it depends on their response to our report. We haven't received it yet as to um, where um, we're predicting that they'll agree with us, that there is an issue and they need to solve it. Right. Well, we're going to track that. We're going to ask okay. the staff to make sure we follow up on that and move it on. Uh, one aspect or one obstacle cited in the GAO report uh, on department-wide screening policy was a, a disagreement, apparently, between the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and the Undersecretary for Acquisition, Technology and Logistics over the level of detail required in screening local personnel. It seems like sort of fantastic that that would bring things to a grinding halt, that they wouldn't find some way to resolve that. But can you give us an update, Mr. Solis, on whether or not they have, in fact, resolved that particular dispute or found somebody that could referee it? Uh, my understanding, and I'm, I'm going to turn to my staff back here, is that that's been turned over now to ATNL to resolve this issue in terms of trying to figure out what the background screening requirements are going to be. And, and you're, and it, but do you want, believe that will happen, that, that that's the right place to boot it to and, and get that resolved? Well, again, our recommendation was that there be somebody who's sort of referee between USDI and ATNL because I don't know that it clearly falls in either spot, but there needed to be some, some way of, of, of coming up with a plan that would incorporate what USDI would be looking for as well as ATNL. But my understanding is that it's been turned over to ATNL, and that's about as far as what we know at, 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 at this point, and they have not responded in terms of what the specific things they are going to do. That is something we'll continue to follow up on. Uh, we Obviously, it's a very important issue in terms of the background screening, and, and that's something that we will look into. And finally, Mr. Yugon, you, you mentioned that uh, your report didn't really get into an examination of subcontractors on that. Do you think most of your recommendations with respect to contractors would also apply to subcontractors? Yes, the process itself is absolutely critical, particularly when it comes to uh, the requirements up front, uh, translating it into a statement of work and the actual contract administration. Those two areas we think are absolutely critical. 
If you don't get it right in the beginning, you're going to have problems at the end. And also, contract administration has the payment function in it. Uh, that is a recurring problem in the contract administration. Not having the invoices and receipts of goods and services reconciled is a key issue. Thank you. Uh, I suspect we could probably go on for quite a bit of time because your, your written testimony together with your oral testimony was uh, very provocative uh, and very in-depth and, and informing. I, I think we're going to stop at this point in time, but I want to give each of you an opportunity uh, to tell us if there's one thing that you think we didn't cover deeply enough or didn't mention at all that we should have, uh, and, and that would be probably a good way to wind down. Mr. Solis? Uh, I, I think we've covered a lot, and I appreciate the fact that the subcommittee has had this hearing, and I think there's a lot of things that have gone on with operational contract support that need to be looked into. Obviously, we've talked about a lot of things that they haven't done. I think there's opportunities for the department to move out and, and, and grasp these things, and, and I think they, again, uh, as Mr. Flake mentioned, uh, asked about best practices, I think they're aware of what they need to do. It's a matter of execution at this point. And so I, I would just offer again, the only other thing is that I think there needs to be more planning for the use of contractors in contingencies. I think by doing that, that will eliminate or mitigate a number of the issues to include things like host nation trucking contract problems. Thank you. Ms. go. I think as money flow into equipping and training the Afghan National Security Forces, uh, the department needs to apply the lessons learned uh, from um, prior contingency contracting practices, particularly paying attention to planning for the acquisition up front as billions of dollars are flowed in uh, to do the mission. Thank you. Mr. Bowen. Mr. Chairman, you were exploring the causes of, of these, these problems. The, when, when did they begin? And we were talking about log cap, but I was thinking contemporaneous with the expansion of log cap in the late 80s, early 90s, was the decision, perhaps as part of a Cold War dividend, to drastically reduce the contracting core. So just as outsourcing was expanding, uh, the capacity to oversee and contract manage that outsourcing was contracting. And, and the consequences therefrom, I think, are, are with us today. Thank you. Mr. Fontaine. Just one final point, and it gets to training. Uh, if contractors are going to be part of the total force, which the 2010 QDR says that they are, uh, then those uh, military individuals or civilians who go over to theaters uh, who don't do contract management will need to know something about contractors, what they do, how to find out what they do, what the regulations are, whether they can order them to do something or not. Um, currently, if you go out to one of the training places before the pre-deployment training, they're actually run by contractors, but there's almost no one playing contractors. And then when these guys get over to Afghanistan and Iraq, they'll actually find more of them uh, than they will find of the military. The same thing is true of, uh, of war gaming. Con the role of contract is really incorporated. In the 2008 uh, National Defense Authorization Act, there was a requirement that DOD issue a joint directive uh, to bring together war gaming and pre-deployment training, the role of contractors, and integrate that. And they have not issued that document yet, even though it was required in 2008. And I think that moving down that path would be a real step forward. Thank you. So my final, final question, <laughs> oh, no, it's just going to be, would each of you tell me what you think is the place or person at the Department of Defense, the State Department, and USAID where this committee should go to inquire on progress in the area of, of uh, contingency contracting and put pressure on to make sure that results occur? Again, I'll, I'll speak, for, I'll say for DOD because I'm not as familiar with State okay. or A, but I would say again it's, it's combined between uh, Dr. Carter and uh, the Undersecretary for Personnel Readiness. I think it's got to fall between those two because as I mentioned, it's not only a contracting and contract issue, it's a force structure and personnel issue. Thank you. Ms. Hugo. He has two um, offices, NATO Training Mission Combined Security Transition Command Afghanistan and the Undersecretary of Defense Comptroller. Thank you. Mr. Bowen. Uh, the only one I would add is, is Pat Kennedy, the uh, Undersecretary for Management at the State Department. Thank you. Mr. Fontaine. Uh, 
Well, since we're adding people uh, as we go along the table here, um, at AID uh, it's actually somewhat split, but um, the, uh, I think that there's, there's two, um, two areas, both at AID, the office, uh, the, the bureau that uh, handles uh, conflict and humanitarian reconstruction would be the place to go. If you don't go above that to say, is there one locus at USAID that handles these sorts of issues, and if so, why, if there's not, why isn't there? Great. Well, thank you all very, very much once again for both your written testimony and your oral testimony here today. I think we've benefited greatly from it. So thanks for your service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Adjourned. Day three of Elena Kagan's Supreme Court confirmation hearing starts Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern, and you can watch it live right here on C-SPAN 3. Live coverage also on C-SPAN.